It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the next session on, on Native Theater in America. So I'm going to give the stage over to my dear, dear friend, Randy Reinholdt. So uh, one of the first things I think we should do is start in a good way. So I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Lenape people. It's always good to remember where we are. Give me a second. Yeah. Um, and then we always like to recognize the elders that are in the room. Um, everybody take a deep breath. I'm not pointing you out. <laughs> Except one. Because Muriel is important uh, in our community, and we're very honored. To have you. Um, now I usually say, turn off your cell, or you know, turn your cell phones to silent, and all that stuff. Um, what I'd like to do next is ask Delena Studi to come to the stage. Delena is Cherokee. She works with us at Native Voices, but she works with a lot of people in the room. There's all the bright, happy faces uh, at, at, at Test It Too. And Elena has agreed to share with us a piece from her one woman show, which she also wrote, And So We Walk. Show's been around the country. Uh, we saw it in North Carolina, where it opened with Corey Madden directing, and then Corey directed again. Well, I think a lot of you know Corey. Uh, at, at Portland Center Stage. Um, and I've asked Elena if she'd like to contextualize the show a little bit for you. And then she's going to present just a little bit um, with her script up here on the stand. Uh, now she's memorized it. <laughs> so without further ado, Delana Sue. Hi, my name is Delena Studi. I'm a proud citizen of the Cherokee Nation from Oklahoma. Wago, thank you for having me here today. Uh, just to give you some idea about why I introduced myself in my language is my father always told me, always know whose land you're on and always be able to introduce yourself in your language. By speaking our language, we are practicing our tribal sovereignty and we're keeping our language alive. And um, just to give you some background about who my father is, my father is a first speaker Cherokee, which means his first language is Cherokee. He's also a product of the American Indian boarding school system. Are you familiar with that? Let me see if raise your hands. Oh, okay, perfect. So my father was forcibly removed from his parents at the age of nine and sent to a boarding school where he basically had the Indian beaten out of him. And this actually affected the way he reared me as a child. I'm the first person in my family to not go to boarding school. Uh, my father married a beautiful German-Irish woman by the name of Carolyn. And so I always joke that I grew up in uh, between two worlds. Uh, my mother is very Christian, a very strong little woman, very Oklahoman in nature. My father is very Cherokee, which means he's very matrilineal. Women have power, women have a voice. And so I grew up between those two worlds. I would attend ceremony with my dad on one weekend, because we do ceremony every other weekend. And then the weekend I wasn't with my father, I'd be going to church with my mother. And so um, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma. I could literally see it from my house. And uh, my father taught me to be a very outspoken woman. I did not know about gender roles until I moved to Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, so um, what you're gonna see tonight is a little bit of the show that I've written about my father. Uh, so three years ago, my father and I retraced my family's footsteps along the northern route of the Trade of Tears, starting in Cherokee, North Carolina, and traveling through Georgia, Tennessee, Illinois, Kentucky, Missouri, Arkansas, and then finally to our home in Oklahoma. That's 990 miles together on the road. Uh, and when I first started writing the play, it was going to be about people I met along the way. And you will meet some of those people in the little segment I'm reading you today. But I purposely kept my father and my story out of it. And then I started working with Corey Madden. And Corey said, we want you to tell that story. We want to hear what it was like to be on the road with just you and your father for six weeks. And so, um, 
just so you know, when I was doing this with my father, I was determined to be the best Cherokee person in the world. <laughs> and so I spent all my time trying to make the project better. Like I was, I was working nonstop. I was getting maybe four hours of sleep at night, barely eating. And every waking moment was about setting up interviews and going to different people's houses and ceremonies and just networking. And my father, on the other hand, was being actually an authentic Cherokee. He was showing up for people, right? He was just being, and that was what being Cherokee is all about. And so my big joke was I set up this entire six week journey with my father so I could bond with him, get to know him as a real human being. And I spent more time bonding with my computer, whereas my father actually got to do the real bonding with people of Cherokee. And so um, my father became an instant celebrity once we got to North Carolina. And for those of you who have met him, uh, he's a very quiet man, but he commands a space when he enters it and people want to be around him. And so I had this sudden spark of jealousy working with my father, because here I was putting in all these hours, and my father literally just had to show up. And people would flop up. And so uh, the scene you're about to see happens at the end of Act One. And basically, it's me dealing with my jealousy of my father, and also learning what it means to be a real Cherokee person in Cherokee, North Carolina. So, uh, Wado, well, thank you for letting me share this with you. I'm going to move this over here for right now. It's after dusk when my dad, Emily, our young dad with good intentions, and my producer and I leave for yet another one of my father's social engagements. I mean, true, I was hoping my dad's Cherokee-ness would lend me credibility, but I had no idea that his popularity was going to crowd my production calendar. <laughs> <laughs> I am trying to be a good Cherokee woman. As we drive deep into the mountains, and into the woods, my father tells Emily, the Gatillo Storm Dance is a sacred event. Up until 1979, it was illegal for us to practice our religion, our songs, our dances. But we did anyway. We hid out in the hills and we kept the old ways. And during the Trail of Tears, the Cherokee who were removed from North Carolina to Oklahoma they carried the embers of the first fire with them. Now, 150 years later, my cousin John and some others, they brought that fire back here from Oklahoma. And tonight, we are going to the Gatillo of the late Walker Calhoun, one of the stomp dances where the fire was brought back. Emily perks up. Wow. He walked all the way back with the fire? <laughs> walked. He drove it back in his pickup. <laughs> and then my father's laughter rocks her SUV, and I can see that mischievous glimmer in his eye, and I know he's excited. The directions lead us to the small house perched on the side of a mountain. An elderly woman named Ida greets us like we're long lost family. Oh, Miss Dirty! We were hoping you'd make it. And we are whisked inside. <laughs> for dinner is waiting for us, prepared in the traditional potluck style. Now the men sit at one table and the women at another. My father takes his place with the silent men, assuming the stance I only identify as belonging to a Cherokee man. Arms folded across the chest, mouth relaxed, not a frown, but not exactly a smile either. Emily and I are invited to sit with the women who are in the midst of a hushed conversation. Now, an aunt's girl? Well, they released her from the hospital and into our rehab facility, but if she don't want to stay there, we can't make her. Another woman named Twala shakes her head. That's a shy. She is so young. Seventeen. Well, she's not the only one. We need more facilities to have them all. Maybe better programming, perhaps more cultural classes. 
Wait. I have planted a bug in many a councilman's ear. Now, hopefully, one of them will listen. Well, if not, another election's coming up. I chime in. Well, have either one of you thought about running for tribal council? <laughs> Run for council? Oh, I ain't getting involved in no political mudslinging. Besides, I got more power right here. <coughs> Planting my bugs. That's how things get done. <coughs> Now, the men might be the representatives, but we know who's really in charge. <laughs> now, come on, let's go to water. I didn't grow up going to water. In fact, up until a few years ago, I didn't know what it meant. I was visiting my Cherokee friend John in Wisconsin, and we had walked down to the Green Bay. Hey, let's go to water. Oh, I. <laughs> I don't think we should get in the water. We won't be, just you know, kneel down and do this. And then he kneels down and he scoops up a handful of water over his face four times. That's going to water. That's how we wash our face in the morning. It's ice cold water four times. Well, that's going to water. My dad had never told me that. Went to a BIA boarding school, right? You probably had to hide the fact that he was keeping tradition. You can't get in trouble for washing your face. <laughs> Twala's voice brings me back. Now, you and Emily, you're not on your moons, are you? <laughs> Cycles. Oh, no. Why? Does that make us unclean? No, Emily. It makes you more powerful than any mess. Now, we Cherokee know women are sacred, are powerful. We keep the culture alive. We create the next generation. Now, Mrs. Stewie, do you have any children? Oh, no. Well, then you're just a girl. You haven't fulfilled your womanly duties yet. <laughs> but you will. <laughs> and then we crouch down next to this mountain stream. Ice cold water cascades down. Now, this stream, it comes from Medicine Lake. Medicine Lake? I thought that was just a story. Now, well, there's no such thing as just a story, mm -hmm. especially here in Cherokee. Now, when, when Yona, a bear, was injured, he made his way to Medicine Lake, and he jumped in, and he swam across, and when he came out on the other side, his wounds were healed. Maybe yours will be too. And then Twala leads us towards the stomp grounds. We women walk in single file under the shadows of tall trees with only the sound of the stream following us. And though I can't see the stomp grounds, I can smell the smoke. I mean, here I am at the foot of a mountain that is home to Medicine Lake with the smell of the first fire greeting me. And I turn towards the stomp grounds and I see lightning bugs dancing in the trees. We reach a grassy clearing and I can see the foothill and the valley where the town of Cherokee lie below, lit only by the full moon. And I can feel all of my ancestors standing beside me. And I wonder how I could ever feel lonely again. And I know without looking that my father is right behind me. It's beautiful. I want to bring our whole family here. Now come on, Lena. Let's go see if this stomp is any different from back home. We follow the inviting aroma of burning oak, and we enter the circular arbor which sits in a grassy field. It's a small, intimate gathering of 20 to 30 people. And out of the seven clans of the Cherokee, we sit with the clan of my host, the Deer Clan. If we were home, I would be allowed to sit with my father's clan. Since we're matrilineal and our clans are passed through our mothers and my mother is white, I am a woman without clan. I will always be a guest. 
As we sit on the wooden bench, a handsome young man wearing a traditional ribbon shirt approaches my father. Shio, I'm saying, is this your first time to the stomp grounds? My father, arms folded across his chest, looking just past Sam, says, yes. I came out for the first time two weeks ago. Now, have y'all stomped before? Yes. My <laughs> dad, what a charmer. <laughs> <laughs> now, are y'all from the Paula Boundary? No. Seriously, how does my dad ever make friends? <laughs> <laughs> We're from Oklahoma. Oh, Oklahoma, Cherokee. And I swear to God, my dad just grunts this time. <laughs> oh. Yes, we're a Cherokee nation. You know, I'm Cherokee. I mean, I'm not enrolled. I'm trying to find out more about my ancestry. I've been doing some research over at Red Clay in Tennessee. You know, the Blue Hole. Sir, I will gladly give you a tour. You just say the word. Thanks. <laughs> Lena, give him my number. I bet you thought my dad didn't like Sam. Of course my dad likes Sam. <laughs> Sam's just like his children, just like me. A young person of Cherokee descent trying to find their place in this world, trying to navigate that thin line between the modern and the traditional, trying to prove something to ourselves that can be proven, something that lies in our very bones, our blood memory. We sit side by side as the ceremony begins, listening, the men singing, the women's turtle shells rattling, the laughter, fireflies, our own private sentinels skirt the sacred circle, never entering. And the beat of the water drum guides me, and I find myself dancing as if each step is etched upon my soul. Even Sam joins in, but my father does not. He says his knee is hurting him. But I know he's content, taking in the sights and the sounds, and I realize being here tonight with my father at a stomp grounds that has ties to my family. We both know. We belong. We are a thousand miles from Oklahoma, but we are home. Uh, I'm gonna ask each of you to introduce yourself. Talk just, just a little bit about who you are. Um, I've got some questions that are going to help us have a conversation. We'll start with the panel. A little bit about who's in front of you, what they do, what the perceptions of the field are, the changes they've seen, and where we need to go next, and your role in that. <laughs> so that's our next uh, 45 minutes. <laughs> and then uh, we'll have time for, we'll take a break, and we'll have a Q&A after. So remember, this is all leading up to what you're going to help with in the important work we all do together. So, Jillian, tell us a little bit about yourself, that you're in Gloria across town, oh, running yes. for a while, and, you know, stuff. Okay, uh, so I'm currently doing a Gloria of Life at the Darrell Roth Theater, and I have the great opportunity to not only be able to play a Cherokee woman and our Cherokee chief woman, man Clark, on stage, but I get to speak my language on stage, and um, as a little girl, I grew up with Loma. She's actually my cousin. My, my grandmother, Lizzie, is named after her grandmother, which was Lizzie Mankiller. And so to be able to finally play my cousin on stage and to tell the story has been a dream come true for me. And so we just extended until March 31st, although uh, our producers think we'll extend further. So if you'd like to come to the show, let me know. I can give you a staff discount. <laughs> <laughs> Tansy, my name is Tannis Peranto. I am Métis from Northern Alberta, um, Zone 6 to be specific. Um, and I am New York based now. I uh, just got back from Ashland, Oregon, doing the world premiere of Manamasa. Mm. Been back for months, so still getting back into New York. Through 
Um, I've also recently done, I narrate audiobooks, and I've done uh, three recently. One is out, it's called Trail of Lightning, about a Navajo monster slayer, <laughs> like young adult sort of, and then two that are coming out in January. One is um, I Am Sakawaya, Sakajawaya, for those of you who might not have heard the other pronunciation, and the third one is The Heartbeat of Wounded Me. Very exciting, but I think everybody should listen to it. It's an incredible book. Uh, I'm Uriel Miguel. Uh, a long time ago, I was uh, talking like this to a group of people in Canada, and we were talking about theater, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and at the end of all of that, uh, a voice way in the back says, well, who are you? <laughs> and I realized that I didn't do the protocol like you're doing now. Uh, and so you really have to tell who you are. It means your grandmother and your grandfather. I just said to someone, Mr. Rappahannock, who's your grandmother? <laughs> you know, that it's so important to us. So here goes. No way. I have three names, Muriel Miguel, right son, Mr. Rappahannock, and Waga Nadili, which is Kuniel. I am Kuna and Rappahannock. The Kunas come from of the coast of Panama, a place called Cuneo, and the Rappahannocks come from Virginia, the Powhatan, I'm part of the Powhatan nation. I, I am from the Star Clan. Uh, I live in, and was born in Brooklyn, New York. My mother and father met in New York City, in Brooklyn. I am truly a city in me, and proud of it. Uh, I am the director a group called Spider Woman Theater, which is over 40 years old. It's a feminist. <laughs> and still going strong. We're now intergenerational. My older sister is 91. I'm not telling you how old I am. <laughs> but there we are. And I have my granddaughter also in it, and she's 24, so we go from 24 to the oldest in time. We just came back from a tour of, uh, of Seattle and, and Oregon and uh, Vancouver and Upper uh, Nipissing in uh, North Bay also. Uh, and then I went away to do uh, a meet with a woman called Maka Kleiss, who was someone I met many years ago who, who is from, she's in Nook, from uh, Greenland. And we were taped as radical elders and we had to do a piece. And we came up with eight days <laughs> with a radical elder piece. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all. <laughs> I'm Jean Bruce Scott. I am not a native person. Um, I came into knowing about Native people, my dear husband Randy, Brian Holtz, um, who when I met him knew that he was Indian, but didn't know <coughs> a lot about his life and said, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that means when people say, are you Indian and how are you Indian? And then I went home with him, and oh my goodness, he's very Indian. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we started to, to uh, listen to more to his grandmother's stories and, and talk to his grandmother and both his grandmother and grandfather um, took us around to Oklahoma, um, took us to the, the tribal lands and, and the, uh, we met the chief at the time. And, um, we just started to learn more and um, we were teaching at the time at Illinois State University. Where's Dan? We have Carter's here. Uh, Dan, we have Dan. Uh, and uh, we were asked, when he was asked to bring in a native play. Uh, it was 1992, and they were looking for something diverse. The university was in at the time. And so uh, we started to call people. Um, we called Joan, we called uh, Mark Taylor Form, Nicole Chavez, uh, Cynthia White at uh, Oregon Shakespeare. And they said, well, we know a couple, but really, uh, you're, what you're doing, asking questions, is the right thing to do, and let's find some more, and let us know when you do. 
So we, at that time, 92, not many uh, uh, wheels, bells and whistles with the old computers, so we were on the phone, we were sending snail mail, but we started to get responses from Native writers and Native artists who were here in the United States and in Canada. Um, and that's how we got started. Uh, our first uh, call for schools went out in 1993. Our first festival was 94. We were lucky enough to meet Muriel and her sisters in 96, you know, doing a brief events, uh, now that you made me do. We were so scared when they walked into the room that <laughs> they would like to play or not, and they liked it. Uh, so, so we went on from there. So we've been doing, uh, working with uh, many of the playwrights now for 25 years. And uh, it's my school. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jay Park. I, uh, I'm an actor and, uh, and uh, sometimes an educator. Uh, <laughs> I uh, started as an artistic educator right out of college, so I've kind of been doing them simultaneously for way too many years. One of my college classmates is in the room, so I know we're, it's, it was a while ago. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm, uh, I'm Cherokee and Mexican and white, and uh, I, I like to think of myself as a real panoply of the American landscape. Uh, and as in the city in the two, I spent so much time working with uh, nations from all over the country, and uh, specifically with uh, urban native youth, that what I've done as an artist was informed more by what I experienced in that part of life than, than anything else I could imagine. And uh, so, you know, everything I do, whether it be commercial or whether it be for my own artistic endeavors, always comes back home to that. And uh, that's why I consider myself an educator, even if I take a year off of teaching. For the rest of my life, my, my goal, my mission, and the artwork we make will be to also bring it back to our youth so that they can be artists for us. So I skipped my introduction because I figure y'all know me. Um, though, the NEA did a really cool podcast uh, this past month, and it's a half-hour podcast with me about the founding of Native Voices in honor of our 25th anniversary. I'll make sure I send that link, so you know if, you, if you're interested in that, it's, they did a beautiful job. We were really impressed. Um, so what I wanted to do next was ask each of you to think a little bit about you know, what you've been doing professionally recently, and then kind of link that up with some of the changes you've seen in our field. Now, I said something about two to five years, but since we have some perspective up there, you might want to go a little further about, so what have you been working on? You talked a little bit about that, Muriel, but what have you been working on? What interests you? And then what, what does that signify some changes that are happening in the field of theater in this country? Um, we don't have to go in order like this, but we'll start with the one. <laughs> <laughs> so, whoever wants to. Okay, all right, I'll go then. I was, I was deferring. <laughs> I don't know who he was looking at. Was like, maybe, okay. um, so, for me, I, I'm also the current chair of the SAG AFRA National Native Americans Committee, where I used to serve as the Diversity Advisory Committee. Uh, as their chair as well. And so my, I've dedicated my life and my artistic work to creating a voice for our people. Growing up in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, no one ever came to my school and said that being an artist was a creative career choice. That was not a possibility. And, um, and so what I do, I think if you were going to look at the underlying value for all the work that I do, it's the Cherokee concept of Gadugi. So Gadugi is the coming together of a people to celebrate support and promote each other. And it doesn't just mean Cherokee people, it means an entire community of people. Like right now, we are a community of people. Our job is to build each other up, support each other, and promote each other, and celebrate our victories. And so for every good thing that comes to me, it's very important that I give back to my community. And so one of the ways I do that is by being the chair at sag -Aftra. And, um, and you know, since I've been the chair for the past 10 years, um, we went from having 0.02% of people in front of the camera. That's not even a full percentage. That's 0.02%. And now we have 4% of people in front of the camera. 
and it doesn't sound like a big jump, but it is for us. Uh, we have uh, we have some we have two native uh, television writers who have sold pilots, which will be being made very soon. In fact, one was just out here doing a scout for his new show, uh, and so we are making strides that way. Um, it's you know, unfortunately, I think it's still the situation that if you're going to see a native person on screen, they're going to see them in a period. Um, but we're, we're hopefully building that bridge where we can see Native people as contemporary human beings. Um, I know it, it, sounds, it sounds really crazy, but yeah, that's, that's a big leap for us. Uh, I'm very lucky I'm doing a TV show right now that I, I can't mention, but keep your eyes out for it, where I play a contemporary woman. Um, and it's that was a big first for me. Um, I'm still only auditioning for Native roles. I've yet to audition for a non-Native role. And even when I do theater, uh, whenever I get hired, I'm hired to play a native person. And then if it's a repertory theater, they'll fill me in in other places. If I get hired to play the native role first. And so uh, for me, one of my big goals is I'd like just to uh, audition for a non-native part. That would, yeah. That's what I want. Yeah. I just want to be able to I not even get the part, just audition for it. Uh, I'll dream bigger later. Um, <laughs> And then because, I think it was because of that need, I was tired of waiting around for someone to write a role for me that I wrote my own play, which is, and so we walked. And I also got tired of these uh, misconceptions about Cherokee people, especially the Cherokee princess story. And so I wanted to make sure I showed uh, our Cherokee women as strong and powerful. And so that's something that uh, I did. I just got tired, so I, I wrote my own piece. And so I started writing more. Um, I'm going to be writing another play that deals with, I, I jokingly call it the Cherokee version of August Osage County because it's basically a Cherokee family in Oklahoma and the craziness that is somewhat based on my real life um, and my parents, which they'll appreciate again. Um, and also my big dork, I love science fiction, so I started writing a graphic novel about a native woman superhero and I've been working on that for a while, but uh, I, I hired the illustrator and so I have an illustrator in town that's actually uh, doing the panels as we speak, and I'm turning that also into a series. So this is, these are some of the ways I've done to keep myself engaged and active, and also uh, to create my own opportunities. And you know what we're doing at SAG after is we're now basically we're a consulting firm. People will call us and say we need somebody that can speak this language. Who do we talk to? And I'm able to get people hired for like the TV show Westworld or different movies or. And so we were able to create that bridge from us as a resource to people that are actual community members that can help you tell the story the correct way. And we do that for free. We, we actually make that connection for you for free. Um, I have experienced some of the things that Delaney was just talking about. With, I've only been in New York for 10 years. And three, my first three years were grad school, so I didn't do much. But um, what I did get to do, because I didn't get cast in a lot of things in school at the time, it was really upsetting. But then what it made me do was uh, do a 180 and look for work outside of school while I was in school, which my the new school for drama allowed us to do, which was great. And I uh, got involved in the Native artist community that way. and. Um, Started working in New York, but doing um, a lot of readings of plays and showcases, equity showcases, very limited runs. So in the, I've only been I guess seven, working for seven years outside of school, and since then, um, a lot has changed in my personal career. I guess now, like actually, this year was the first time that I. I had an equity contract that was not a showcase contract, so it was like it was OSF Ashland, but it took seven years <laughs> to get a contract. It was still a native role, and that's fine, <laughs> but it took seven years to do to accept a real a real contract that was a longer run than like twelve performances or two weeks. Because equity showcases are so short, um, so I've seen some growth that way, which has been great. Um, and yes, OSF is an ex exceptionally long contract, but, um, but it was fantastic. Out there. Um, also, in the realm of film and TV, I uh, audition a lot for mo the majority of it has been native roles. Um, we're all auditioning for the same parts, so all putting ourselves on the team for the same parts. But in the last, in 2013, I booked House of Cards and I played a native woman, but I played a contemporary native woman, which was fantastic. I did work in a casino as a waitress, but I, my, I loved it because my character was a fully, she, the writer was not native, but he, he consulted with me about my character, which was 
straight and she's a fully fleshed out human being, which I loved, and had her own story to tell. Um, and then last year I booked Designated Survivor, which came out this year in March, and I got to play a tribal chairwoman. And that was amazing, because I didn't have to be, you know, in a period piece and bucking in feathers. Um, so that was really exciting. So I've made some strides that way too. But yeah, like Selena said, it's I, I've gotten to audition for, I feel like those doors and being in New York has has allowed me to audition for um, shows that don't, that are just not native characters. They're just like, I just play an FBI agent or, or someone's mother or what. So some of those doors are being opened now, but more of those doors need to be continued to be opened. So I'm seeing a little bit of progress, but it's, it needs to be so much more. Yeah, uh, to, to just make a point about that, this is a very, not to, to, just to reverse this and make it optimistic for a moment, this is an amazing time for us. I can't impress upon this room enough. Some of you in this room are agents of this change, you know, and I just want to thank you for the work you're doing with us. But this is the first time in our history, after many of us, I mean, the Spider-Man, as she will tell you soon, worked decades making art all over the world. And that's beautiful. But a general consensus of mainstream art for Native Americans has been a leather and feather game. And that is a fact. In the last 10 years, all of a sudden, the cultural, the cultural revolution is happening in spite of so many factors. I mean, I grew up as a city, in the, which means several different things. One of those things is that I grew up with pop art. I grew up in pop culture. I grew up with hip hop. I grew up around crack epidemics. I grew up being a marginalized person in a community where you just kind of lump yourself in with the marginalized community around you. As a young child, I knew more about an African-American plight and a Mexican-American plight than I really could understand of our native plight. They, I mean, the, the, the honest truth is, even the most hardened gangster looked at me as a mystical figure. <laughs> I, I kid you not that in, in Oakland, where I'm from, and where you, know, you talk about another hometown boy that's good, Tommy Orange, his new novel about yeah. being an urban native in Oakland. Oh, yeah. it, it, it's funny how, no matter how marginalized civilizations are there, they looked at us as mystical beings. Like, they would kind of t t t just tote me around, like, <laughs> like their little Indian kid, like, hey, look what we have. <laughs> and, 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 and that kind of a unicorn mentality was part and parcel to making us historical figures, not contemporary or present day figures. In the last 10 years, we are seeing the turn. We are seeing the doors open. We are seeing a light in which our stories can be shown on the world. And these things that just happened in the last couple of years, mainstream theater has produced more Native American work than ever before. And these women have all been part of it, and Randy. <laughs> and I get to be part of it every now and again. And, and so many playwrights are being produced at such a high level in so many different ways right now. We've never had that before. And I want that not to be just an exciting moment. This cannot be a fad. This has to become a goal. Because this country is our country. You better believe that. <laughs> <laughs> and we should be more of a part of the art, even than we are today, and more so forever. I, I look artistically at this precipice to opening a doorway where our art forms are so commonplace that you can take them for granted. You guys all have stories in your head of art that you've grown up on, art that many of you made, art that many of you are influenced by. <coughs> I think about film noir, I think about action films, I think about blockbusters. These are formats that are in your blood. They're in all of our DNA. You know the archetypes of the stories that you were grown up on. And I want our indigenous archetypes to be in the DNA and the fabric of everyone in America. I want them to take our stories for granted. I want them to be as familiar with Cherokee Nation as they are with the state of Ohio. I want those things to be synonymous. That in the last two to five years has started that. I want to make sure we continue. I look at it in a different way. 
guest speakers. I'm much older than any of you. And uh, years ago, uh, what happened to Native people in the United States was that we were forbidden, there was an act, there was a religious act that forbid us to do any of the ceremonies. And with that came a lot of people from out west and midwest that came to New York. And they came for many reasons. They came because they were uh, left stranded for the rodeos and the wild horse shows. They were left in New York. They came because they were interested and wanted to get away. But a lot of people came because they wanted to share their knowledge, their stories. And they took them, they took them to Brooklyn. And there, a lot of these older people came and told their stories to us. We were a group of young people just ready and ripe to listen to this. And yes, we all knew where we were from, but these were other people that were coming into our homes and teaching us songs, teaching us dances that I'm sure we were not supposed to know, teaching us, telling us the stories that I'm sure we were not supposed to know. But there, some way, they wanted to really make sure that a lot of this culture, their culture, was left somewhere. And it was, a lot of it was left in Brooklyn. I mean, to me sometimes it's so interesting. I, uh, when I was dancing, I used to show dance, I, I would show dance in two, you know, Southern and Northern style. I, you know, I, uh, one time, because we had many people stay with us, uh, would wake up and I would hear the Sundance songs that were happening by someone that we would carry around with us, that stayed and lived with us. When I was Sundancing, I heard those songs. I knew those songs. And that was something that, that was so amazing to me that, that it happened like that. Um, I just came from Norway and uh, this woman who was part of a group called Squat. I don't know if you remember Squat. <laughs> it was Belgium. So I knew the, 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 uh, the director. And this woman said to me, do you know there was a Kuna that went uh, on tour with us? And I'm thinking about this. I can't remember his last name. His first name was Carly. And he, he uh, sold herbs. And, he, was, he knew about herbs. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, all of a sudden I realized, that's my cousin. <laughs> Here I am in Norway, talking to a Belgian about a cousin of mine. And all of that to me is so interesting because it brings together, Indian country is small. And how do we keep the threads going for us? That's what's important to me. Um, I know this is a terrible thing to say, but I'm really not interested in, in uh, TV or film. I'm interested in hitting the community, talking to the community, trying to uh, connect in the community, this community here in New York City, uh, a community in Nipissing, Ontario, of keeping those threads alive of who we are. Now we're talking about things that are really scary, and we're talking about missing and murdered, disappearing women. And that's what I'm working on. I'm working on how do we talk about it if nobody will talk about it. And so I've been in there going into different uh, places, into different communities, different reservations, different reserves, and talking about it. We have a workshop called the Fabric Workshop, Pulling Threads, again, that we're making quilts with women and trying to find ways of getting women to talk. And we talk about things like, how do you follow the poison? You are not victims. The spotlight 
is on everything. We have to talk. We, these things can't be secret anymore. And so we, what we have done is bring a lot of fabric into the workshops. And uh, then we ask women to just pick something that uh, reminds them of them. And, and then we ask, who do you love? And then we give them buttons and thread and beads and anything that they want there. And they start making a patch. And there are certain questions we ask. Tell us uh, about a scary moment. Tell, is it your, your scary moment? Is it another person's scary? Or are you making it up? It doesn't matter. But if you want, don't want to tell the story, but you want to put it in the patch, we'll carry the patch with us. And that's what we do. So it's a different way, I think, of looking at that. I, um, Oh, people call me negative, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when people say diverse, I, you know, I feel like I have to hold on to my underpants. <laughs> <laughs> because diverse a lot of times means that you're checking the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, we've got Indians there now, but now we have natives there, you know. And it means nothing. It means nothing. So I'm really interested of how to go into the community. But not only how to go into the community, but how how do we get a space here in New York City of the native people that are here, and how do we, how do we make it grow? Uh, I've been talking to you know mayor's assistants and all these, and have because I really feel that we deserve a space there. We're first people; we have to be here, and so that's how I'm thinking. And uh, the other thing I have to say is that not only the Lenny Lenape's, but there are many others. There's the Shinnecock, there's the Matinnecock. There are all these other Native people that lived on this land. And, and also, like my family, that have been here for over 100 years, you know, that all of those people should be recognized. They are our community. <laughs> A, uh, a contemporary native theater community in Los Angeles over the last 20 years, and um, our our we have an open door. Uh, if you're a native person and you're in Los Angeles, uh, you can come to us and you can meet uh, other native people. Um, we've had we've had native artists come and work with us for a week, and as they talk to one another and tell their stories they've discovered that, in fact, they are related. Yeah. Um, and it's, 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 I love that. it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And what, we had one a young man uh, who was adopted, uh, Robert Mesa, mm -hmm. and didn't know his family. And uh, he started to tell some stories, and he's pulling those threads right now to find his story. <coughs> and he discovered a cousin, uh, Jordan C. Mm -hmm. uh, Carmelo is his cousin. And so all of a sudden, now he has that story. Mm -hmm. And what we do at Native Voices, and he's your cousin? Oh, he's my adopted cousin. It was my uncle Wes <laughs> that took him in. And oh, so he right. and Colin are like brothers. There you go. So, mm -hmm. so, so not blood related, but native related. We encourage Indian those way. stories, Indian way, Indian way. We encourage those stories. Um, and we, we start with the playwright and the writers, but in 20 years, we've also had to work and build the, the, the actor community. So we teach acting workshops and, and we do all that. Um, I want to ask just very quickly, how many in the group out here have seen a Native play in their lifetime? I love this group. This is my pillar. That's fantastic. That's amazing. You know, we ask that question in other conferences and two hands go up. Um, so you are, as, as, as Jake said, you are at the front of it. You are, you are definitely helping with the story. Um, I think you can hear that, that we need both community stories and contemporary stories. Um, so when you go back to your institutions, um, think about uh, asking who's native, whose land are you on, what are you doing, what is your purpose, and find out whose community you're in start to invite that community into the theater because we are we are aware these last five years anyway that there is a native voice on the American stage and that's 
what we've all wanted for all of these years, is to, to have that voice and those stories on the map. So what we thought we would do is let each of the panelists have just a moment to have uh, share a closing thought of kind of what this conversation has helped them think about. And uh, hopefully their closing thoughts will pro provoke you a bit for some questions. That's what we want to get into next. What questions you have. It could be anything from um, how do I check out my own heritage to um, um, how, how, how would I bring a native play to my venue. Anything in between. So uh, with that in mind, um, Again, we don't have to start in any particular order, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we can just think about a closing thought of, uh, or you know, maybe an open thought of uh, what this conversation's had us thinking about. I was really struck by how many hands went up, and so I just, I, again, I want to say, uh, please continue to go and see native plays, uh, produce native plays. Um, uh, I didn't give Dan part of his due when we talked about the beginning of Native Voices. He, we, we came to him with, a, with his 20 plays and didn't know what to do with them when they were looking for one to produce. And so he said, well, you know, find five. Let's do a festival of play readings and, let's, and then we'll find a production for the next year. So he committed right off the bat to five. We did readings of five plays. One was selected for the next year, which we produced, and we did four more readings. Mm -hmm. in association with the festival. And then Dan uh, produced an equity production in Pennsylvania uh, the third year. So I mean it was really that was that was the start <clears throat> and, and Dan was was instrumental in that. Uh, yeah. 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 The last few years uh, Bill Rausch of the OSF has done a great job bringing the native uh, performance to land was one of the first. Uh, to, to, to go, and then uh, with Off the Rails, they had seven in the company. The next year with Manhattan, they had ten uh, act, native actors in the company, and it was very nice because they played not only the native roles in the native plays, but they were also uh, in the other plays. Coming up this next year, we think we we're just trying to do the count on who's been cast for next year. We think there are at least ten, possibly eleven native actors in the company at OSF. So there is a wow. major commitment by Bill by Bill Brown. So that's what I wanted to jump yeah. onto that too. Um, and uh, one of our wonderful actors, Sean Taylor Corbett. He has been cast in two non-native roles. In fact, his whole season is playing non-native people, which is a, yeah. I think that's, I don't want to say it's the first, but it's, it's, I would say it's the first. <laughs> I mean, I, I, and what I know of in, in the history of that company, it's, a, it's going to be, it's. The reason this is important is because the only way that we will, we used to be told that people couldn't do a native play because they couldn't find native actors. That is, that is no longer, that's no longer the case. We have 42 members in the Native Voices Ensemble in Los Angeles. We're gonna bump that up to 60 in the spring because everybody is working. They're not in LA anymore. So when we have our ensemble meetings, we don't have enough people in the room, right? So now we're gonna bump that up to 60. Native actors are out there, Native plays are out there, and I just encourage you to do it. Is that good? Okay. <laughs> After doing that, I had to, um, just to add on to that, um, I did a lot of Q&As and I talked a lot with the patrons and they were, um, I felt really honored and lucky to be part of a show that had such a powerful impact on people and they would express to me how they were so amazed that they didn't know so much of what they learned in our play about the history of, of Native people. Um, and how we're still being affected today by <coughs> the past. And they couldn't understand why is this play not being done in Manhattan as <laughs> it is about the very land that we are on right now. And I didn't have an answer for them because I am an actor and not a producer. Yeah. And there's a some disconnect there where I don't understand how all that works and I don't know the people who can pull those strings and make that happen. And so it was a little disheartening to say, I know, I, I, I don't know how to, I can just hold space for you and feel the same way as you, but um, I feel the same way, I think it needs to happen. On that note, I will say there are interested parties in New York discussing it uh, right now. <laughs> and anybody here who's interested in taking part of that conversation, <laughs> see me and I'll put you in touch with them. And uh, it's, it's still not only plausible, but I think it should happen. <laughs>
You met the playwright uh, from Manhattan, I think, two years ago? Yes. Molly Smith was the person of the year. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Correct. Uh, Mary Catherine Nate. Yes. Yep. Molly was prophetic and said, "This Mary Catherine Nagel is probably going to have a pretty good career." <laughs> Mary Catherine Nagel, and uh, she had three Lord Productions this year, different <laughs> scripts, and uh, it's got another show going up at uh, Portland Center Stage. It's coming yes. season with yeah. Molly Smith directing again. Yeah. So saw her play the Molly in Washington. Right, sovereignty. I was in that. Jake was in that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Larissa Fast Horse had a show at Playwrights Horizon that was extended Thanksgiving play. Uh, Sean Taylor Corbett, who was just mentioned, had a reading of his uh, musical, his mom, Lynn Taylor Corbett, uh, oh, the over here's musical, the playbill. Uh, called the Distant it's Thunder. Yeah. And uh, we had very good news from Sean today as an outcome of that uh, reading. Just uh, let your imagination go wild. Yes, mm -hmm. that's what happened. Oh, yes. um, and then uh, Ty Defoe is someone else who we would mm -hmm. have loved to have on stage with us today. Mm -hmm. Ty was in Straight White Men uh, mm -hmm. recently, and uh, <coughs> it's not that. And, uh, <laughs> and Ty, uh, Ty is also a co-creator of a play called Aji Jack on Turtle Island that's now being remounted uh, for tour, and it's starting at the New Vic in the spring. And uh, and uh, I'm, I'm the cultural consultant on that, which is why I know that. <laughs> And we also have another native actor in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, Rainbow Dickerson yeah. is here in the back. Uh, and uh, Rainbow was just also in Manhattan. So these are just the names of a few, but I don't want to just name these few and have you think, you know, and that's it. We'll be extinct if you don't employ us. You know, that's really not the thing at all. There are thousands. And um, those of you who look for talent, we, that is part of our mandate at Native Voices, mm -hmm. is to make sure that you can connect with the talent that you need. Mm -hmm. I met about uh, two years ago, I was at a conference at Stratford, and they asked me if I was interested in Midsummer's Night Dream. But I was thinking it in a different way. I was thinking about our pixies and our fairies and our tricksters. And so mm -hmm. And uh, so they invited me to bring people to uh, Canada to uh, work for a week on something. So I invited an all native cast uh, and with uh, me directing it. And we did a piece. And it. <laughs> It wasn't too much Shakespeare in <laughs> so they, and that was one of the criticisms that there wasn't enough Shakespeare. Mm. And so they wanted me to figure out to make a project out of it. I thought it was already a project. They wanted me to really make a project to find something that I really wanted to look at and work on through this through the time that they wanted to give us. So we thought about it, all of us, and I decided not to do it, that I wanted to do it on my own, because I realized it's like being at Lincoln Center, it's a big institution, and things are out of your hands. The, 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 the way you work on stage, the, 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 the music, the, uh, the designing of the set is all out of your hands. And we all wanted to keep it in our hands. And um, so I bet money in, and I uh, brought people in from Canada, uh, which was really, really important to do because I feel that there's no borders for us. And what are we doing with these borders? So I make the mixture of uh, the States and Canada. And uh, they all came. Uh, to uh, a theater, we worked in a theater, and um, and we started to work on what we wanted to do with just one part of this, of what, you know, what we're thinking about it. But I realized what I'm interested in here now is that, well, for one thing, they took language away from us. You know, it's great to hear her talk about and, and say it in her language. It always gives me such a thrill to hear 
the language being spoken. And so I, that's one of the things I want to do is to start bringing in uh, speakers and the speakers teaching and see how far we can get. And it may not be Midsummer's Night Dream, but the, the depth of what a word means and the layers on the word that uh, I, I know and I remember from my family those layers and how important it is. So that's what I've been thinking of, mm -hmm. is working with, well, it's a, it's a cast of like 13 at the moment. And, and uh, that's what I want to do, is, is uh, do Midsummer's Night Dreams. Mm -hmm. It's called Misdemeanor Night. <laughs> they have a similar program like that in Alaska. Um, Princess Lupe Johnson and Alan Hagen are doing it. And so they recently they did a King Lear that was in uh, Wichin. And uh, they've also done, what else? I want to say they did a, a make me. Yeah. 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 I'm not thinking, I'm thinking about that, but that's like only half of mm -hmm. what I'm interested in. Art. He's right here. Just post. Oh yes. <laughs> Art. You did a movie. Parents of the Year. Did you? And right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Ye
Hi. Um, I think this is a problem, a perennial problem about casting in general yes. for um, underserved communities. Um, and if we wanted to present this kind of literature in my department, mm -hmm. for instance, because we think the stories should be told and people who are not necessarily native, people should know them, how do we go about casting? Uh, I've been at the University of Texas for 18 years. I've never had anyone self-identify as native or first people or indigenous. So does that mean that we should not be doing the plays in the department? Or do we have some leeway? Or I mean, what are your thoughts? It, it depends on the playwright. Mm -hmm. And uh, by and large, the playwrights that we've worked with have been very amenable to colleges reading their plays and casting non-native uh, actors in, in the roles so that they can learn the literature. Um, I, I would say that one of the things that you would absolutely uh, want to do or need to do is to bring in a cultural advisor uh, so that what you're doing is culturally appropriate and whatever a non-native person is doing as a native person is appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, but with those things in mind uh, and pushing the playwright, I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't use some of the work in your classes. Um, I know we get requests all the time from particular plays that we've produced. So we go straight to the playwright and say, this is going to the University of Texas. They have their native students, but they'd like to, to work on this play. Um, if, would you like to get permission? And then, and I, I don't think we've ever had anybody say no so far. I'm, I'm interested to know how the native people on yeah. stage feel about the spirits. About casting? Mm -hmm. Non-native. Mm -hmm. yeah, at an academic institution versus a professional. Well, I think the reading is different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't go for it at all. I mean, across the board, I don't. Maybe something to add to that. There are several plays by native playwrights dealing with contemporary native issues that have no native cast. Well, the Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving play yeah. is written for that particular That's reason. That's why she wrote it. I, I would say, too, that um, a lot of institutions that claim not to have native actors have none because they've never asked the question. And there's never been a reason for anyone to identify that way. Mm -hmm. We did a co-production with uh, South Dakota Rep. Um, and we actually, so we put money in. University of South Dakota. University of South Dakota. South Dakota. University of South Dakota. Um, and they, they had one native a actor in their uh, student body. Um, and so we then complemented that with three additional. We did uh, stand up at Highway 37. So we brought them in under equity contracts. Um, and so we put that together. We did the same thing at uh, University of Montana. Montana Rep. With Montana Rep. So, I mean, there are, there are also ways, there are other ways to do this and, and actually honor what, what uh, you know what I'm saying, is putting, putting native actors in those roles with your students um, to help uh, that cultural crossover. We've done the same thing at Ohio North with Gloria and with, uh, and with Peggy's Place and on Highway 37. Yeah. And, the, and I know that every university doesn't have the same amount of resources at their disposal, but I will say, Another element on top of just looking for natives to ask for a theatrical correction is in your institution. <clears throat> it's very important to me that if you have uh, resources or connection to do this at your university, it is important that we start using the institutional body to publish these works as well, in the same way that they will publish a new edition of Mac, or they'll publish a new edition of The Tempest for review. I think it's a very it's a very nice doorway in to give our young writers and our new writers and our, our seasoned writers the opportunity to be considered on the same literary basis at that institution. Not just bringing in the play to show the kids that there's native plays, but back that play, fund that play, make it a part of the curriculum. And therefore, without having to look for a native student to cast even, you can also make sure that it's still in the minds and now in the hearts of the young people that are making artists there, because then in the future they'll make that more part of their basis. And, um, and also, it's important to not just tick off the educational box that you use the native play that year, but that that native play is being given life by its connection to the institution. And if you can do that, that'd be great. Is there a, a way to promulgate a series of anthologies of native writing? 
Uh, sure. Of course there is. And, and we pitch them all the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, prominent institutions say, well, but we have this one from the 80s. Uh, there's one that a passport. This is quite a Yeah. Yeah. Did it actually so, to answer your other uh, the question you didn't ask, ask, there are several anthologies of David plays mm -hmm. that are published and ready to go. Um, Diane Glancy's been anthologized, Carrie Dodd has a few, Roberta Uno has a really important I mentioned script. about three anthologies. Yeah, the... the and uh, okay. was this a Hane Gigawa? Yeah. Yeah. Contemporary yeah. plays by women of color, uh, just came out by Roberta Uno, the third edition, I think, that Muriel yeah. is talking about, yeah. but I think also there's two others. previous yeah. to those. Uh, Thompson is regularly anthologized. So there are lots of plays by Native folks that are published already. There's the American Indian, I may be getting the name wrong, Community House down yes. at Battery yeah. Park. Yes. What are, what are its responsibilities? Is there any kind of theater affiliation or performance? Well, years ago, uh, at least three years ago, they, they had to move. And uh, they had a, a, a circle. And the, in that circle, a lot of Native uh, plays were done. A lot of uh, reaching out and what working. What do you mean by circle? In a circle? A circle. A space that was in a circle. A oh, oh. And uh, Spider Woman was there all the time. Uh, and a lot of people working on their their own stuff and thinking about it, all Native people worked from that circle. But as things went on, um, a lot of the grants were taken away and so forth. So now it's a very small uh, space in Chinatown. Oh, so it's not in Battery Park? No. no. But this goes to Miro's earlier point that you know, she is ready for a dedicated space to be in New York. I thought of that. Works that yeah. way. Yeah. It is a need. I think, I, I... Yeah, since I, yeah, since I've been in New York these 10 years, um, I, the community house was one of my first introductions to the, the new community here. And um, I think it was 2009, Jake and I were talking about this earlier, they had a Native Actors Showcase. Um, so we, it was a group of us that did either monologues or scenes. Um, we did it at the, Somewhere, one of the small theaters in Theater Row, um, one night, uh, a handful of in industry people were there, and that was the end of it, pretty much. We maybe did like a couple other readings <coughs> later. Yeah. Um, but it, it's moved, the community house, their location has moved since I've been here three or four yeah. times. Yeah. It used to be in the funding is, east side. Yeah, they've had yeah. many different locations because locations will fall through and funding mm -hmm. doesn't come through, grants yeah. get taken away. Yeah, before I ever moved really to New York, I'd spent a couple grants. a couple holidays here uh, when I was on tour with other shows. I spent a couple of Christmas dinners here with the ASCH when it was across the street from Tish. Right. But of course that, again, the grant was pulled and the space was pulled and things changed. Which goes back to something you said earlier or someone said earlier about grants being given to the same big theaters. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That have public theater is like third on the list, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the public theater, whatever. I'm not here yeah. to fire <laughs> <I'm not here laughs> <to> shots. <laughs> but they, they, for a couple of years, did some very nice uh, some very nice doorway opening for a couple of possible native works. Yeah. And they had the chance to produce those works, did not. Mm -hmm. And um, luckily, uh, places like OSF and Portland Center Stage have taken up the mantle. Isn't there something we can do as an organization to write to the... You know, something that's probably worth noting is my show at OSF, Mary Catherine's show at OSF, Larissa's show here at Playwrights Horizon, all wildly exceeded box office expectations. And I think that's something you could do, is tell that story. Yeah. Because everyone acts like giving a native play a shot in the season is charity. Yeah. Oh, it's not and it's been good business for several key institutions. Mm -hmm. Off the Rails actually sold out every performance. That's true. So I mean, 
it's not just the right thing and to Lamar do. And Lamar certainly yeah. does it. I mean, yeah. say Auburn, and he did uh, material witness. Material witness. Material witness. At Portland City State, I was doing nine shows a week. We kept adding shows. Well, Broke yes. all, all expectations yeah. for the box highest office. Highest attendance, highest uh, gross in ticket sales. Yeah, how did something to you do? Because we saw it twice. It was fantastic. And it was packed. It was packed. It was packed all the time. It was yeah. a great run. And that's another instance where Molly Smith, you know, took it upon herself. She's the artistic director of of uh, Reed State. She took it upon herself to say, no, we can do this to the board. And it took her several years of telling the board that before they finally understood it. And it's living proof along with all of these shows that it's no longer a matter of fear of subscribership. I, I'm saying something slightly to this effect to someone that the fear of subscribership and the adherence to what we think our subscribers want and need has diluted the American theater since the loss of the down. You know what I mean? Since before any of us were born. But when you show them something new, they will eat it. If you bring that new food to the table, they will love it, be nourished by it, and hunger for it. And that sort of that sort of metric of thinking that you cannot risk this because it could destroy your season has been proven wrong so many times that at this point it, it, it is a hollow truth. And, and I think that the more American theater is starting to realize this as our plays become increasingly successful, the more they will just accept that that is how it should be. And I hope that that's the case, but you know. Yes, Ben. So let's talk acting craft for a moment. For the actors on stage who have played Parts that are not as native people. <laughs> there are process and challenge, or what do you have to do in order to? I've only well, played yeah. roles that were non-native. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't had the opportunity yet, so I can't answer that question. I played both. Hmm? I played both. Yeah. Native and non-native. Yeah. 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 So, is there a particular series of challenges or questions as an actor? you have to tackle when you're playing a part that is not native. Sure, it's the same thing you want people that are dealing with native issues to do. Figure out who they are, where they are, what's the depth of the story, what's the connection to the audience. All those great art questions that show respect for the culture of where the story comes from and what it's trying to touch. And I think all of us long for stories that are really talking about who Americans are, how this country was made, the sins we're culpable for, the profits that we are culpable for, and what we can do to change that narrative. It's not going to change because we voted. That would be great if we voted. That would be great. But we've got all kinds of work to do, and I think a big part of the work right now is who are we? Where do we come from? How did we get here? Indians are obsessed with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, would, I mean, I feel like that's sort of a general acting question, but I, I, would, I would contest that even when we play native roles, the, the, the requirements are the same mm -hmm. as a non-native role. You know, the given circumstances still have to be built to build a character that's <laughs> part of the story. You know, standard acting fair, but. But I also think that we've also, most of us, spent so many years trying to fill an archetypal role in many of the main roles we've been given, unless it was an original work we all made. <laughs> well, uh, how I feel is that when I was young, I made that separation that if I was a, I was a dancer. And as a dancer, I would do modern dance and do all of that. And on weekends, I would be shawl dancing, I'd be doing other things, and I made a definite decision that that's how I did it. But it was like being undercover. Mm -hmm. You know, I was not showing myself, and it took me a long time to really show who I was. Mm -hmm. And and I think it came out, well, you know, I was part of open theater, so, you know, I did Mare Ubu, I did, I did all those type of, of, of uh, that certainly weren't native. Mm -hmm. As a native person, so the, the persona that you inhabited was as a native person, even though it was written 
No one thought about it. I was given Merubu, I did Merubu. No one thought of, about it with me. I had, you know, I was in Viet Rock. I was in all those old things from long ago. And I remember um, being at Yale and uh, the Black Panthers coming in and uh, attacked the stage because there were no dark faces on stage. And I had a fit. You know, I ran up right to the, you know, the footlights. So what do you think this is? You know, and I got attacked on both sides for that. You know? Yeah. Accidental woman. Yeah. Well, I was naked in that one. <laughs> Accidental and unnatural oh, yeah. women. Right. Woman. Right? Yeah. woman uh, by Marie Clements uh, addresses the issue of missing and murdered women, yes. and indigenous women. Uh, and that was a huge success up in Toronto. I don't think that it's been produced in the United States. No. I'll tell you a piece that most many of us have been a part of that has never been fully produced. It's never been more than a reading, and that purposefully so because uh, Mary Catherine Nagel created a piece with survivors who helped pass the Violence Against Women Act. And the, the name of that piece was Sliver of a Full Moon. And the reason it's always been a reading is because when she uh, travels and when, when she puts it on, we do it with some of the survivors. Mm -hmm. And Mary Catherine and I have talked at length about this because I think I've done it 13 times. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason to not fully produce it is because to have it done by professional actors and make it a theatrical event will diminish the power of those women standing there, standing up for us, and in sharing their stories, giving truth to power. There, that is an instance where theatrically, we just act as supporters, mm -hmm. as agents for them standing up and, and giving their truth to power. And, um, and, uh, and, and I think that it's pieces like that that offer us a unique doorway in. I mean, you, talk, you talked about performance. I think I've been trying to be somebody else since I was five, you know? And, and you, you talked about Yale, and it kind of hit me that a few years ago, I had this little revelation hanging out at the public theater doing Shakespeare with Ron Van Loo, who said it to me. He's an old educator you know, from Yale, and I here in New York again. He said one of the best things I've, I've ever heard, and I'd never heard it in that way. He said, you know, no matter what you build, no matter what you create in your character, you are you. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about it. And he said, look at me, you know. Here I am, I'm an old, skinny gay man, uh, shaky voice. Now look what I can do. And that hit me in such a strange way, no matter what I build, no matter what I pretend to be. When I do things like Sliver, and I act as a supporter for genuine people, adding their voice to our theatrical movement in this case, adding their voice to our culture, uh, I find that it is, it is the unique and the only chance I get as a performer to say, whatever story we're telling tonight, this is me, look what I can do. And I would say that's the one difference towards creating any other kind of character. That is an honesty that no matter how much I like to pretend, oh, I did Othello once, and we were doing a native version of Othello, mm. set in World War II, so all the other actors were white, and I was, and I was native, and I had a native uh, adjutant. A native actor from Alaska who played my, my, my commandant. And that is still just a fictionalized story. Because when you're speaking Shakespeare's story, you have to tell Shakespeare's story. And, and it still wasn't a true to power moment. But when we tell stories that are contemporary and that are us, then yeah, it is a little different than any other. Yeah, on that note, um, that's something I got to experience working with Spider-Woman, um, which is a huge part of my uh, my own development also as uh, my identity as an indigenous person. Um, the way in which we worked on Material Witness, which was about um, sexual assault violence against women in and, out, in and outside of our communities. Um, in the rehearsal process, we got to stand up and tell stories that either happened to us or we knew that happened to somebody. And so we had the opportunity to tell our own stories if we wanted to, and some of those stories got brought into the piece. And 
we eventually got to tell our stories like you get to tell your own story on stage so um that was that was a really valuable um, part of my my development as a professional and and personally as well i think we're getting pretty close does anyone have a burning question or last thought you'd like to help us end with yes well, i don't know if it's an end but i, I was very thrilled that four of the panelists are women you were talking in your piece about how there was uh, an expectation of women having a stronger voice in the community mm -hmm. which you came from or where your father came from and i'm wondering if um because i'm listening to everything that you're saying and it's uh, about getting produced and this is something that every minority including women um which is not a minority but community mm -hmm. comes up against in trying to to be seen as valid as respected as classic as worthy of study as you were talking about jay and I'm wondering if in the Native American artistic community, is there a greater acceptance of the female voice as an artist in your experience than in the outer world? Is that it? It's funny because I'm doing the opposite. <laughs> right. Because I've been working with women these last over 40 years. Right. And, uh, and I just started to work with uh, men, you know, not students that I I have, but in in uh, in spite of women, I just started to work with men during misdemeanor uh, night. That and 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 it came out of um, one of the uh, counselors, you know, uh, came up to me and said, I I think now is the time to start looking at the men and letting the men tell their stories. We're on reserves and, res <laughs> and, and reservations now. And uh, so so my feeling was, well, it can't be me. You have to find a man to do that, <laughs> you know, and just tell their stories. But she was really talking about, about the idea that the women are working. You've got to get the men to work now. So that so it was opposite of what you were saying. Really fascinating. <laughs> How about for the rest of you? Um, maybe I think over the years of producing, we've produced more women than men. Yeah, um, and we do seem to get more scripts in by women than men. Though it's gone up lately, more uh, uh, we were seeing more men writing, not necessarily more men than women. Right. But we're seeing more men writing and uh, looking for that balance. Mm -hmm. It's interesting though because Native people have, have, have more matrilineal exactly. uh, culture. Than, exactly. That's than, why that's why culture. That's why culture. Right. culture. Right. So it, it makes sense. Like your family is very female. It, it strikes me yeah. that it's difficult to write if your hands are across your face. <laughs> 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 that's what I mean. yep, that's so true. Uh, yeah. I mean, to speak to that, I, th I think it's probably so many things, at least from my own perspective, I've almost exclusively worked for female playwrights when doing Native work. I have worked for some male Native playwrights, um, uh, only a few times though. The vast majority of the Native artists I meet, and as an educator, it is very much the same. Steve Allen, who many of us know, is maybe, and a man, uh, a couple guys in the Northwest, Gene Sagaban and Roger Fernandez, are maybe the only male theater artists that I've ever worked with who are also educators. The, uh, well, Bill Yellow Rope is an educator as well and a playwright, and he's one of the playwrights who I've worked for. Uh, but but as, far as, as far as that goes, that's about it. And, and, and many of them have been women, the educators, the artists as well, and and I, I I think there is something to the mentality of uh, of the matrilineal heritage, but I also think there's something to the culture, the the oppression that Native people have undergone for every generation, even even our own generation, which is the least oppressed <laughs> so far, is still coming from a background of not having anything stable underneath us in, in this society. And I mean, it's strange for me to say that women are simply stronger and more resilient, and more able to 
break out of that than men. But there is a truth that there's a kind of stoicism that's been put on the native community amongst the men that they would never admit to until recently. And it probably kept well, them. those warriors. What's the name of those warriors? Yeah. They're, they're, it's, it's something about uh, fighting for women warriors or something <laughs> like that. And yeah. That was amazing to me. And, and I think that, like Randy said, you're getting male voices now finally saying, okay, we can do this. Mm -hmm. we, we, can, we can share our part in it. But I, and I'm of two minds of it. I think that's great. And I also think I don't care if there's another male protagonist in anything for the next 20 or 30 years. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm with, I'm with Ruth Bader Ginsburg on that when they asked her, when will, when will it be enough women on the Supreme Court? And she said, when it's all of them. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's been all men. It's I mean, it's fine, it's fine to me if men aren't in charge of anything for the yeah. next 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> That there were more men writing in Canada than the States? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah, when you talk about Canada, now that's where there's a whole bunch of male writers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Do you think it's a different writers. course, or do you think it's a different tribe? Well, it, is, it is notable that Canadian natives uh, have a stronger connection to higher education and uh, more prolific uh, mainstream production. Than Native Americans in lower 48. There was also a lot more funding 20 years. Yeah. There's still no funding, period, for Native theater. Period. That's, I mean, that's a completely different aspect. I feel like we've got men and women who've been writing for you know generations upon generations, and and, um, and what's happening now, uh, you know, it's funny how how many people don't often think of. The civil war is currently going on, and how much worse it's going to get now that Brazil has uh, hired a dictator. I think we're getting close to done. Yeah. Thank you. There we are. Thanks. <laughs>